Hi, I'm Harper. Um, so I, uh, I try and put swords on the cover of every presentation I do. And these I thought were really good. So I'm going to go ahead and start. So I'm doing five tips for, uh, for better communities. So I hail a long time ago from a company called Threadless. How many people here know Threadless? How many people here wear t-shirts ever? <laughs> OK, so we have a few. How many people that wear t-shirts have bought one from Threadless? There's, there's, there's a couple. So I'm going to go through what Threadless does. Threadless is a crowdsourced t-shirt, or just a crowdsourced design community. Um, Threadless started in 2000. Um, but basically, what they do is you think of an idea. This is very just general crowdsourcing. You think of an idea. You think how it would look on a shirt. You submit it to the website. And the website's like, oh, yeah, that would be a great shirt. Or that's not a very good shirt, or whatever the website says. And then uh, if, it, if it wins, so to speak, apparently, Back in like 2007, the lawyers told us we can't talk about winning and losing because then it's a sweepstakes or something like that. But if it wins, so to speak, um, you get paid money. Um, so here's some of the stats. Founded in 2000, roughly $30 million in revenue in 2009, 100 million votes or more for shirts. Um, that's a lot of people caring about shirts. 100% of the product was designed and curated by the users. So we did zero product that was built by us. Um, I used to joke that we did the hard part, which was taking money. Um, over 2,500 designs were released, millions of shirts sold. Um, we made a lot of mistakes as a company, sourcing our own shirts, what do you do with a million shirts on a boat, um, all sorts of fun stuff. But the really fun thing was just uh, being part of this giant crowdsourced community. So as you know, the internet is serious business. And I do uh, believe in Alexis's mantra of, you need cute cats. Or just cats. I don't know if that cat's cute. Um, he looks a little kind of. He looks kind of serious. But the internet is serious business. Um, even for the veteran, building building communities generally is uh, very tricky. And this is my favorite picture of a double-edged sword. I asked my friend Scott. Um, hey, I'm talking to all these people, and I think a lot of them are trying to build communities, and they might not have a background in it. And this is what he said. I don't design spaceships. I, and I think the point is, is that this is a very tricky world. This is, a, this is a world that even someone who does this regularly, even the veterans, we don't know how to do this. I think that if Alexis and I got together and tried to build a reddit list 2.0, well, there's a very good chance that we would fail for some very good reasons that I'll get into. But it's a very difficult thing. Um, so one thing I did, because I don't really, I'm scared that I don't know much about communities, is I went on Twitter last night and I said, hey guys, what is a community? For you, for my 4,000 friends on Twitter, friends, friends again, um, for those 4,000 people that follow me, what is a community? And I had two people that really, that I respect a lot, reach out and kind of say, these are some things that are communities, these are what the words, these are some just off the top of my head, free form, what communities are. That's a lot of text, and I don't believe in putting a lot of text on a slide, so I went through and made it this. Um, basically, I think you can boil it down to five things, and I'm going to go through each of these five things real quick. Authenticity. So this is Charles Festa. Charles Festa is a, is a member of Threadless. He's also an early employee, maybe employee number five or six. He got a job because he worked at FedEx, and he went to Threadless and just hung out one day with his friend that he went to high school with, the founder, Jake Nickel. And Jake was like, what are you doing tomorrow? Why don't you work for us? And I think he just called in sick for like two weeks and then quit his job. Um, but Charlie, he's a crazy person. This is someone that I usually would not involve myself with because I don't have any real way to identify with him. Um, through Threadless, we became very good friends. He's more of a creative. He's more of a designer. He's, more, he's someone who is often mistaken for a homeless guy based on his facial hair. Um, but he is, he's someone that is just... He's really out there. But what he represents to the users, he represents this person that they can identify with. He's young, he's creative, he always comments on everything that's posted. If there's ever critique of Threadless online, he's first in line to be like, hey, have you thought about it this way? He's constantly that person that represents, we are the real deal. And if you have ever a question for him, he's always jumping out to answer. And he's a real person. So if you search for Charles Festa or go to charlesfesta.com, you can learn about this crazy guy. And he really is crazy. He's hilarious. Um, he's, a, he's a good friend. Next one is purpose. I really love these shirts. We had one that said, uh, I, heart, 
NY, like I Heart New York, but in the, the heart it said, have never been to, in like secretly, so you can barely see it. Um, but the thing about this is that it really represents the purpose. A community has to have a purpose. And I was talking earlier to some people in the room over there, and we were talking about how it's very hard to build a community when you're trying to project the purpose. If you're trying to say, hey guys, you should all hang out, or have a, let's, let's have a party, and it's gonna be about, I don't know, uh, tuning Audis. But I don't have an Audi, in fact, I don't drive. So how, how, how authentic is that, and how is that purpose going to really seem? It's not gonna work at all. So you have to find that thing that fits under here, the I heart, what is that thing? And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be anything, and, and, and the exciting part about the long tail and the internet and all that is it could be the most random, weird thing in the world. It could just be like, I really like, you know, I don't know, brown cloth or whatever. <laughs> that was a terrible example. <laughs> this is probably the most important, that's not true. There's two things that are more important after this, but this is one of the most important things, especially I think in this world, which is safety. You wanna give people a place where they can trust is safe for them to participate. Um, one of the problems we had at Threadless was we created this environment, it was very, very safe, very safe. Then we had all this success where the masses started appearing and suddenly you would be, a, like we had this, <laughs> this hilarious experience where this guy was, I don't know, he's probably like you know, 25, kind of famous graphic designer, submitted a shirt design and this 13 year old dude was like, dude, that design blows. So this guy's like, what are you, what? You're 13. And the guy's like, whatever, I've had like three shirts printed, what have you done? You know, and he's just like, well, for one, I make more money than your parents, you know, and for two, I'm double your age and all these various things, but it didn't matter because this 13-year-old kid was just talking shit. So what ended up happening is we had to create two forums, this like secret one that we called the alumni club and then this public one. And the alumni club was for these people who wanted to be maybe a little more aggressive. So we were like, if you want to go and like kind of not troll because it wasn't, they weren't trying to hurt the community. They thought they were helping. But, by, but they were helping by being a little more aggressive than the noob really needed. Um, another example of this is my brother is a terrible designer. He's seriously one of the worst designers I've ever seen. He's a great guy though. Um, but he, um, he kept designing these shirts for Threadless and they were, they, were, they were just terrible. And of course these 13 year old kids and then also now this 26 year old guy was just like, dude, this design blows, you're a terrible designer. And he knows this, he doesn't need to be told this. He just wants to win the 2,500 bucks at the end of the game. And so what he would do is he would, when they said, hey, your design sucks, he would end up just kind of falling out. And he'd be sad because he didn't feel safe. He didn't feel like he could participate. He felt like he was just gonna get dissed. So what ended up happening is we lost a lot of people. So to solve this, we created a program that we called the Critique. And what the Critique did is it allowed you to upload your, your in progress or I'm kind of an early designer, or I'm young, or I don't, I haven't been trained, or whatever. And then the community would come together as a group and say, hey, I like where you're going. Have you thought about this? And so it wasn't just the guys being like, your design blows, because you're competing directly with them. It was those same people saying, your design blows. Have you thought about changing the font? Um, and it started to really enable these people to, uh, to participate. And that goes on along with the next one, which is empowerment. It is very important to create tools for the users to, I guess the better way to say this is, um, if you're trying, like moderation is a huge topic amongst these communities. Um, Reddit does a very good job of, of empowering the users to self-moderate with the up and down arrows. Um, you know, flagging, all of this stuff. Creating separate communities if your community doesn't s suddenly fit in with the normal community or the, the top community. Um, all of these things are the same tools that you would have as the manager of said community, but by giving them to the users, you've kind of, well suddenly you get to relax because you're not worried about some crazy person coming in there and like being a dick. Suddenly you, all that person happens and then everyone's like, hey dude, we try to be nice here. And then maybe they vote them down. And you're like, wow, I can sleep now. I don't have to be constantly worried about this, about some sort of weird, uh, just, I, 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 I don't want to say extremist because I, that's not my world, but just something that's really on the, in the outlier. Um, and at Threadless, what we did is we had no cops. We had no admins, we had no moderators, we had no tools. We had to physically go in on the back end to delete the entry, in, like if someone commented. So you'd get these people who would go and upload crazy pornography and we'd just be like, oh man, because they knew it was a lot of work to delete it because we had no tools to do that because we did not believe in deleting content. So when it was actually rude or violent or terrible, we would delete it. 
Otherwise, we let the community explain to the community member that, that violated um, the safety of the other members that they were a bad person and they shouldn't do that. <laughs> so um, there's some really funny examples of this. And how many here are familiar with Flickr? So I was talking to a friend of Flickr, and he was talking about some tools that they had that, of course, everyone will deny they ever had. But one of them is a flag you can put on a user that is the no sense of humor flag. <laughs> so they could mark someone as not having a sense of humor. So if you're just like, April Fools, like we delete your pictures, or whatever they do these days, um, like that person would not be part of that joke. So like that's a great example, but how awesome would it be to be able to give that to your users? So then they can kind of start cataloging the people who aren't going to have fun with the meta topics or all this weird stuff that happens in a community. So I really, I think the challenge I, I give you is when you're building a community to counter like violent ex extremism or whatever that word is, um, really think about you want to moderate it from your side and that's very important. But what can you give to the users to have them self-moderate? That's going to really help with the authenticity as well. Because if a peer of mine says, yo, Harper, you should chill out, you're kind of, you're offending people, that's going to be way more interesting than if, you know, some random dude I don't know <laughs> says that. Which leads me to the next one, which is trust. So I, I, I want, this was first, because this is the thing I like to talk about the most. But I think this is the most, this, but I put it last because it's a bigger topic, and I don't really, I have a harder time talking about it because it's so big. I think this is the one that blows up a lot of people's heads. Because what ends up happening is people like us, we want to create a community to help people that aren't like us. That happens all the time and you see it on the internet constantly. And usually those communities fail because I think there has to be parity between the person who is creating or moderating or facilitating and the person who is consuming. I don't think I would run or want to be in a community that that dude's in, although I'd probably buy his cars. But I think what, what you can do is you can empower the people with, you know, whether it's with the tools or whether it's by having represent, like representatives such as Charlie that are authentic, and you can have them represent that trust. Um, you give them all the tools to be able to manage and to facilitate, I think it will help a lot. Um, so I found this quote by Abraham Lincoln, and I, I found it on the internet, which I think is hilarious to find quotations, because you never know if they're real. So if this is not a real quotation, I'm sorry, but I got it from Alexis. <laughs> And uh, he told me it was totally legit. Um, that's a, that's a, uh, a threadless shirt as well, that the Abraham Lincoln with the trucker cap. Um, but I think this is very true with, when, it, when it comes to online communities. The people when rightly and fully trusted will return the trust. And so if you, as creators of these possible communities, give them the tools and trust them to solve the problems themselves, I think they will then in turn trust you guys to create a community for them. And until you trust them, they will not allow you to create that community. And I think you see that a lot when you see all these uprisings in, in the Middle East right now who are using Twitter on their own terms. They're using all these tools on their own terms. They're not using the tools that we would want them to use very easily. Um, so yeah, so here's some resources which you can barely read, the URLs. Um, but if anyone wants this, I think these guys have the slides. Um, and there's a couple others that I want to reference, but I, I felt like um, I didn't want to put the URLs up. So uh, the first one is, How Open Source Projects Survive Poisonous People. This is a really great presentation by a couple of Google engineers who helped build a bunch of large open source software projects. But what they talk about specifically is, often in these large, open, freely participated um, software projects, there's someone in there that is just a terrible person. And how do you deal with that person? This is something that you can, you can watch and apply to your everyday at work. You can apply to your, you know, your, you always have those poisonous people no matter where you are. And it's just how to deal with them. It also applies 100% to internet communities. Um, Please Feed the Unicorns is a really great um, startup guy in the Bay called Abraham. He's Abraham on Twitter. This is about how to build an ecosystem around your product that allows developers to expand it. So maybe you can create this ecosystem and then you don't have to create the tools to empower your users, the developers will. And this fits a lot into like the Apps for Africa and all this Code for America stuff, where if you create a tool for these developers to build, they will build on top of your platform and you don't have to do any hard work. As a software engineer, my job is to go to sleep a lot, as much as possible. So I want to build something so I never have to build it again and they'll do all the work. And that's, the, that's the key to life. The next one I think is the, the right now is kind of blowing up people's minds um, in the online world, which is the real social network. Um, and I love how it's V2. 
So this guy is a UX guy from Google, and then he just went on to Facebook, and he has this presentation that is about 100 times as long as mine, and it's full of just these, these nuggets of how we live in a real life social network. We don't have to rely on Facebook, and Facebook, and Flickr, and all of these social networks that are out there right now are failing at permissions. And so from in, enabling people to have a trust, like trust in their network, feel safe, empowered, we have to make sure that we represent the permissions that they're experiencing in real life as well. So this is a good place to start for that. Um, then I have a couple more that are a little more crass. Um, I need a vote if you want to hear them. Okay, so there's the, uh, I didn't even look at the vote. I was going to tell it regardless. Um, so the first one, which you need to Google, it's very important, is called the Internet Fuckwad Theory. Alexis knows this one. Um, basically what it means is if you have any person plus anonymity, what did I say that word? Anonymity? Anonymity equals douchebag. That's it. And so I wanted to put this up here, and I, and, and I, and I didn't because I, I couldn't write that word onto a presentation for a bunch of people I didn't know, but I apparently can say it. Um, it's an important thing about realizing that on the internet, like Alexis said, everyone, not everyone is a dick, but there's a chance that they will be 100%, always. Awesome, well that's me, I'm Harper.